Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to see you all uh, on Zoom as we are very used to at the moment and will continue for, uh, I think, at least uh, throughout this winter. It's a great pleasure to uh, uh, invite you along to this great workshop that we have today. Uh, it will be co-chaired by my uh, Great colleague, Georgio Sebulis. I'm Elsa Sanset. Uh, I'm a neurologist from Oslo and also the Secretary General of ESO. So uh, the topic of today is how to manage an efficient network. And to start us off, we will get a quick introduction by our eminent vice chairs, uh, Silke and Marie Luisa. Thanks, Elsa. I'm trying to share my screen. Oh. Okay. Thanks to all of you for attending this workshop on behalf of uh, Silke and me. Uh, as a representative of the WISE group. And uh, I would share with you some uh, introductory remarks about the topic of the workshop, networking. So, but what is networking? Uh, broadly speaking, networking uh, could be defined as the exchange of information and ideas uh, among people with a common profession or a common interest, uh, usual within an informal social setting. Networking often begins uh, with a common, sharing a common point of interest. And uh, for professionals, uh, networking is used to expand the circle of uh, acquaintances, find out uh, job opportunities, uh, increase the awareness of uh, news and trends uh, in uh, the fields of interest. And uh, networking works in several ways. So people uh, generally join networking groups uh, based on a common point of interest. Um, the common point of interest for professionals uh, could be a professional affiliation, but also a scientific affiliation, as in our case. And the best networking opportunities uh, um, may occur at seminars and conferences for, for us. And these events are designed to attract a, a large board of like-minded individuals. Uh, networking is useful. Uh, it helps a professional keep up with the current events in the field to develop a relationship and provides opportunities to help other people find, make connections and catch up on the news. But uh, as you can see in, in this uh, picture, uh, this is uh, an example of a static network, but a network is not a static creature, it's a dynamic creature. And, uh, um, the connection could have uh, different intensities, but they could change uh, in time. Uh, a network uh, is a, a living creature. And uh, um, from a collaborative network analysis point of view, uh, you can find uh, the connection between the uh, individual in the network, but interaction could have uh, different directions, could have uh, different intensities. And uh, for example, the WISE group is uh, a good example of network. And uh, we are a growing network of uh, members. And uh, as far as yesterday, 65 uh, answers were collected uh, within the network. Uh, we are updating the number of uh, our members. And uh, uh, each member is important because a, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Luisa. That's a great introduction to okay. what we will hear a lot more about, uh, I think, for the next uh, couple of hours. Um, just some, some housekeeping. Uh, I think we are all used to Zoom meetings. Keep your... your uh, 
keep your uh, microphones muted, uh, use the raise uh, hand, and you can also use the chat function uh, uh, for questions for, for, for uh, the, the speakers. Uh, I will now uh, leave it to uh, Georgios Sevgulis uh, uh, to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Else. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Francesca Romana Pezzella. She is a vascular neurologist from the Department of uh, Neuroscience, San Camillo Forlanini for Hospital in Rome. She is also a fellow of European Stroke Organization, and she is also with uh, Valeria Caso, a founding member of Physioist Steering Committee. She has published ex extensively in the field of acute stroke. And uh, her lecture is going to be about from networks in the brain to networks of brains. And uh, Francesca, we're looking forward to hear your lecture. Over the last decade, the study of complex network has expanded across diverse scientific fields. Increasingly, science is concerned with the structure, behavior, and evolution of complex system ranging from cells to ecosystem. I'd like briefly to discuss how the network theory and neuroscience interact and raise some curiosity around it with this talk. Thank you to the WISE initiative for inviting me to their, net, to their workshop. It is often said that the brain is the most complex network known to a man. A human brain comprises about 100 billion neurons and 100 trillion synapses which are anatomically organized over multiple scales of space and functional interactive over multiple scales of time. This vast system is the biological hardware from which all our thoughts, feelings, and behavior emerge. Clinical disorders of human brain networks like dementia are among the most disabling and therapeutically, therapeutically untractable global health problems. The idea that the nervous system is a network of interconnected neurons has a long history in neuroscience. Anatomical studies of the brain's CETO architecture, cellular circuits, and long-range fiber systems have yielded an extraordinary amount of detailed information about the brain's structural organization. The ongoing quest to map the intricate networks of the human brain with ever increasing accuracy and resolution has recently expanded in new direction. Technological developments in non-invasive neuroimaging have opened up new avenues towards studying the structure and function of the human brain. These advances are increasingly combined with powerful network modeling tools developed in the course of a broader research effort to understand the structure and the dynamics of complex system. This recent conference of neuroscience and network science opens up a new number of new opportunities for approaching brain function from a complex system perspective. Central to the current thinking about brain network is the concept of the connectome. This word was first coined in 2005 by Olaf Sporns, Giulio Tognoni, and Rolf Ketter and to define a matrix representing all possible pairwise anatomical connections between neural elements of the brain. So the connectome is a comprehensive structural description of network of elements and connections forming the human brain. The truly exponential growth of research in this area in the last 10 years had, has led to investigations of a more general concept of the connectome that includes the matrix of anatomical connections between large-scale brain areas as well as between individual neurons. And the matrix of functional interactions that is revealed by the analysis of physiological processes unfolding as slowly as the fluctuations of cerebral blood oxygenation measured with functional magnetic resonance imaging, or as fast as the high frequency neuronal oscillations detectable with invasive and non-invasive electrophysiology. So as you can see in these slides, uh, here are presented the four steps that constitutes the basic workflow following the mainstream to define the network nodes, the network edges, the network constructions, and then, of course, the network analysis. The three plots shown here, different ways to represent structural connections in anatomical space. 
A present a set of tractography streamlines, red, green, and blue indicate fibers running along the medial lateral anteroposterior and dorsal ventral direction respectively. In B, a network diagram of nodes in red and edges in blue are pre is presented with edge width indicating the edge strength calculated as the streamline density linking each node pair. For clarity, only the strongest edges are shown in this picture. In C, you see a plot representing a nodal network measure, in this case, the node between a centrality. What are the clinical and non clinical application of connectomics? The study of intermediate phenotypes, such as connectome, that are intermediate between genetics and clinical phenotypes may represent a promising way forward to have a better understanding of which genetic or other biological environmental factor participate in disease mechanism, as you can see in this slide. So how do we reconcile the networks in the brain with the network of brains? First of all, we have to take into account the social brain hypothesis. Where, a propose, where they propose that the selection pressure from social interaction rather, rather than from interaction with the physical environment led to the continuous refinement of human behavior. Social capacities, capacities have likely enabled and catalyzed human cultural evolution, including achievements such as science, arts, philosophy, and technology that surpass the speed and breadth of biological evolution. It is widely acknowledged that primates have larger brain relative to their body size than all other vertebrates. So social capacities potentially account for the disproportionate volume and complexity of the primate brain. And this is probably where we may find a way to reconcile the networks in the brain with the network of brain. I would like to present you this very interesting experiment where orbital prefrontal cortex volume was studied uh, together with the social cognition competences. And the social cognitive competence, which was the objective of this study, is intentionality. Intentionality is the ability to explain and predict the behaviors of another person by attributing to them states of mind or intention. Intentionality competence is co correlates with the number of core social contacts that an individual can maintain as a core and social entity, so a network. The more competent we are in intentionality, the bigger is the network we are able to maintain. In this experiment, the relationship between prefrontal cortex volume and intentional competence was tested. The volume of four regional prefrontal subfields in each cerebral hemisphere in 40 healthy adults human was measured by applying serological methods on T1 weighted magnetic resonance images. So, Social cognition tests focusing on intentional competence were also administered to this uh, to the fourth health adult, and the results revealed a significant linear relationship between intentionality score and volume of orbital prefrontal cortex. So, is it possible to reconcile the networks in the brain with the network of brain? Yes, the experiment I presented to you uh, opens up a new way forward to explain what is the brain mechanism underlying social interaction. The discipline of social neuroscience has expanded rapidly and it's, it's possible now to study uh, specialized topics such as face processing, model behavior comprehension, but also reasoning, mental state attribution. And this sensory driven and higher level social affective process that govern everyday life, you see naturally melt into and transition between each other. 
Thank you very much for your attention and thank you again to the WISE initiative for inviting me to this workshop and giving me the opportunity to share with you thoughts around this topic today. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, for that very enlightening and interesting talk. Our next speaker is Professor Tan Wen, who is the president-elect of the Society of Vascular and Interventional Neurology. She's also the director of interventional neurology and neuroradiology at Boston Medical Center and a professor of neurology, neurosurgery, and radiology at Boston University School of Medicine. Tom, we are looking very much forward to hearing your take on this uh, title, Do Women Build Less Effective Networks Than Men? And I suspect we will have another take following you. Good day. It is a great honor and pleasure to share with you on the WISE workshop, Do Women Form Less Effective Networks Than Men? I'd like to thank Dr. Maria Luisa Zetti for the invitation to speak and my co-speaker, Dr. Mario Sikosios, who will be following in this discussion. These are my disclosures. Fierce Pharma published their Fiercest Woman in Life Sciences in 2021, and one candidate stood out. This was Wei King Zhou, who said, it took a village to make me. She is a co-founder of two biotech successful companies. And so this brings us to the question of why build a network? A network is important for career success, intuitively speaking, is important to build your clinical and technical knowledge and sharing of controversial or difficult cases, uh, provide support and guidance, and also increases academic productivity. <clears throat> In a network, there is a notion of a reciprocity of a give and take between the donor and recipient that benefits from this relationship. There are several differences in gender approaches to networks. Women, for example, tend to have more social networks, whereas men tend to be transactional. Women have smaller networks, but stronger ties with those they connect with, and men tend to have larger number of acquaintances. These are, of course, generalizations and observations from studies. One more aspect of women networks are of this element of personal hesitation, which can lead to less effective network and the women thinking about a relationship as important to avoid this concept of over-benefiting. This was well studied by uh, several colleagues in the publication Human Relations in Germany, where they looked at why women build less effective networks than men. And they looked at the role of structural exclusion and personal hesitation. We divide the concept of this idea of less effective networks for women based on extrinsic barriers, with structural exclusion, whereby women are excluded from certain circles. And this can be divided into concepts of work-family conflict, which is intuitive. If a woman has to deal with their family at after hours, they are not available for networking during family time. And also another concept called homophily. Homophily is the idea of a tendency to bond with similar people. Homosocial reproduction processes suggest that leaders, mainly men, tend to recruit, promote, and prefer to work with people who are similar to themselves. This is a quote from one of the women leaders who was interviewed in this study saying that, I can't see taking up golf for networking purposes only. Moving along, we've discussed the extrinsic barriers to social or effective networking, and there are also intrinsic barriers. We discussed personal hesitation, which can also be further conceived of as moral considerations and the idea of gender modesty. When we think about reciprocity within social networks, reciprocity is a given moral norm. It transcends one's ego when one thinks about a relationship with another person. And again, this concept of over benefiting from a relationship is conceived of as socially undesirable. Another leader within the study said that don't aim to join networks for reaping benefits immediately. This is one extreme example of a network that uh, I've joined with several of you in this meeting, um, where we formed a huge network of colleagues across the world to study the global impact of COVID-19 on stroke care and IV thrombolysis. This was formed out of a desire to search for the truth, 
and to search across a global network of colleagues um, encompassing 450 uh, contributors worldwide. So the donor and recipient was such that um, we would give co-authorship in uh, exchange for data from that country for understanding the effect of the pandemic on stroke care. This is another flip side of networking that we observe in a, a conference where they publicize the speakers for this pediatric meeting, as you can see, all male panel. And um, Erica Kay uh, noted on Twitter that more than 70% of pediatricians are women, yet the American Academy of Pediatrics couldn't find a single woman to speak on or moderate this national panel. So it was an outcry. This disparity in gender presentate, representation does not only exist in pediatrics, it exists in neurointervention, the specialty I, I work in. And in this conference, which shall remain unnamed, even as of 2021, among this panel of speakers, 30 of, out of 30 are men. And as a reflection of the ineffective networking of both women and men, I would submit to you, ineffective of women that they weren't able to make the cut, through this national uh, or international panel of speakers, and also ineffective on the uh, side of the men who organized this conference and couldn't make room for a woman. So when a woman looks at this panel, the, the gut reaction is that it is a rather uh, exclusive environment and that maybe I do not belong in this meeting and maybe it's not the right meeting for me to attend. These women issues and the mantles have inspired many movements in women's network. Um, we've created a women in neurointervention network. Uh, there's women in neurology and vascular interventional neurology networks and women in neurosurgery, women in neurology, you name it, you will find it. Uh, leading to this uh, women in neurointervention group that we've started um, as a inspiration to try and connect with women across uh, regionally and then expanded internationally and we rapidly hit the maximum on the WhatsApp application of 256 participants in this global network of women in neurointervention, such that we had to expand to the app Telegram to help accommodate additional members into this network. We've further expanded our network to start with the first women in neurointervention chat group whereby uh, Dr. Anat Harev and Dr. Stephanie Lank gave us a speech on um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And here we were able to reunite with multiple women across the globe to connect and discuss on stenotic venodural disorders. So in your to-do list of how one can become more effective at networking, this applies both for women and men, is to ensure that your website profile is updated and accurate. Uh, to provide a narrative, think about your elevator pitch of how you would project yourself as a professional with your areas of interest and your expertise. Um, this would help others find you for shared interests. If you announce what you're interested in, this would help you connect with others who share your interests and may want to collaborate you, with you. You want to review these profiles at least once a year and then think about opening social media accounts such as Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Scholar, or ResearchGate to help people find you and you to find others. When we think about networking, I tend to move it to the afternoon. Your peak performance is usually in the morning. So you want to do your deep work early and turn off social media notifications early on. And if you're going to network, think about it more in the afternoon. Obviously, Twitter has really taken off in the medical community. And there are many articles on why you should get involved, tips and tricks to get started. So in conclusion, uh, women do form less effective networks compared to men. This has been widely studied. Networking is essential for personal growth, career building, and has an implication for reciprocity between those who interact with each other. Mantles are a reflection of ineffective networking by both women and men and have inspired women movements. The gender differences in networking can be explained by barriers of extrinsic structural exclusions, homophily, work-family conflicts, and intrinsic barriers of personal hesitation and gender modesty. You can still be yourself and build an effective network, build your portfolio, find the mentors, do what you love to do, uh, build your network, and don't worry too much about the credit that will come later. If you believe you can, you're halfway there.
Thank you for uh, an excellent uh, lecture. And uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Marios Psychogios. Marios is a professor and chairman of uh, diagnostic and interventional uh, radiology in the University Hospital of Basel. He's very well known in the field of acute stroke and he has been a pioneer of endovascular thrombectomy. He has introduced the one-stop approach and the safe technique. And we're looking very forward to hear his lecture. Marius, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction, Georgios. Uh, thank you um, to the WISE group for this uh, uh, invitation and uh, this uh, difficult topic to tackle as a, uh, a man uh, and a new interventionalist. Uh, I don't have any disclosures, uh, but I have to disclose that I don't play any golf. So uh, let's start with that. Um, in, in preparing this topic or this talk, I um, thought it would be good to have a little survey uh, of uh, my network uh, regarding this topic. And um, this is the response that we got. Uh, so we have around 60 uh, participants that uh, answered our questions. Uh, and as you can see, there is a little bit bias there, uh, as also Tan um, suggested, because uh, uh, the majority of the participants uh, that are men replied and replied were new interventionalists. So we have 56% 56, 56 of, of uh, new interventionalists, new surgeons. Uh, and uh, in the female side of, um, of this, uh, we have uh, the majority neurologists, so 62%. Uh, and um, uh, this is um, obviously a bias uh, because uh, it comes from my network. Uh, but uh, I find uh, it's also interesting because it, it kind of reflects also the uh, world that we work in and uh, the community that we work in. Uh, with the majority of um, of new interventionists being male, uh, and um, the majority or a bit uh, a big uh, part of of the neurologists that we work with being female. Um, so again, this is uh, one important thing to consider as we take a look at the um, following results. Um, we ask the the participants to state how important networking is to them. Uh, and if they like networking. And as you can see, the majority with 60% says it's very important. Uh, and uh, Tana, I think, uh, illustrated nicely and, uh, uh, why uh, this is the case. Um, and um, also the majority of the participants enjoy networking. So um, this is also an important point. I think that uh, two thirds of, of the people that replied uh, will they enjoy networking and uh, we have also a, a not so small percentage with around 30 percent that say they don't mind networking so they don't really care about it um, and then uh, eight percent that they don't really like to network um, so again here the majority likes to network and enjoys it and also thinks it's important um, and then um, we go to the objective if you want like this criteria that we found um, in the results, um, so, so we asked the, the participants to state in how many organizations or network they participate. And I find this, this first um, table really interesting because um, it, it shows that um, as we move to the right side with more organizations and networks, uh, we find that the percentage of female participants um, being part of, of more uh, networks uh, is uh, higher than the male uh, counterparts. Uh, so again, if we check the middle with four to six, we see roughly the same, 40 to, to 59. Uh, but as we go to the higher um, groups of, of networks, we can see that uh, females uh, with 20% in seven to 10, uh, males seven, and then uh, over 10, we have around 20% of our female participants, and it's only 4% of, of the male. So uh, population. So again, I think this is a, a nice table showing that um, um, at least in my network, um, female um, participants uh, are, are good networkers and, and they are parts of multiple networks. Uh, and uh, it's not the case that uh, they are less effective in uh, being part of a network. Um, then regarding the, uh, the size, the network size, 
uh, it's um, an equal um, frequency for both male and, and female participants. And uh, <coughs> also in the question, if they are well connected, uh, it's also um, not a big difference uh, for uh, both genders. So again, I think that the first table I find is really interesting. Uh, and then if we go to the subjective question, so um, do women build less effective networks? Yes or no? It's, it's interesting to see that um, only 20% of the female participants think that's true, uh, but 45% uh, of the male participants think that's, uh, that's true. Uh, so maybe we here have a, um, a case of uh, unconscious bias. Um, so people thinking something uh, that it's not true, because again, if you see um, in the slide before um, regarding the number of, of networks that uh, they participate, uh, this was not the case, uh, at least in this collective of, of people answering the questionnaire. Uh, what about the question, is it harder to be heard um, as, a, as a woman? Um, and it's interesting that both genders think that that's the case. Um, in around uh, 40 to 50 percent of, of uh, the replies that we got. Uh, so <coughs> both groups acknowledge the, the problem equally. Um, and um, regarding the, the question, are you extroverted? Yes or no? Um, 40 percent of female, 50 percent of, of male uh, replied uh, yes. So um, maybe we have a case that, that men are uh, louder. Uh, as also uh, Tan showed in, in her slides. So uh, to conclude in the survey, and again, I think um, we can have a discussion if we have the time, um, uh, as I don't have so many slides. Um, I, I think this is a really interesting topic. And um, for me, it's uh, the first time that I, I really had some thoughts about it actively. And I have uh, um, a lot of um, thoughts about this, um, you know, on the background of my mind before, um, I'm in the privileged position to work with um, a team that is 50-50. Um, so I, I work as a new interventionist with women and also as a diagnostic neuroradiologist with uh, women in my team. Uh, and I really uh, find this, um, 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 this uh, um, you know, number or this, this equality in the group um, really, really good. Uh, for my team. Um, regarding the, um, the question if uh, women can build less effective networks, so I think uh, there is an unconscious bias in, in place and uh, um, I don't, I don't um, agree with uh, uh, the statement that the women build less effective networks. Um, but um, as a, you know, a migrant myself and, and being already um, um, through the process of working in a, uh, another country after I left Greece, um, you know, after my medical school uh, and uh, being a part of, you know, um, a group that wasn't uh, between the cool kids from the beginning uh, and um, not having everything, you know, um, being easy, I kind of understand how it can be for women in, in a group from, of, you know, like neurointerventionists or men. Uh, working together and not really paying attention to, you know, uh, the um, necessities maybe of other groups and, and of other uh, people and the differences that you can find. So again, I think it's a really interesting topic and, and question in the end, do we need equality in our teams or do we need equity and, and really have a fair environment where, you know, every group, women or men or uh, you know, Swiss people or German people or Greek people, because not everybody is, is equal, um, have a fair environment where they can work and they can network and they can have a, um, a nice working environment. Uh, and especially for women, I think it's really important, and I try to do this in my uh, team, um, to have a, a fair environment also, because, you know, we are talking about equality a lot, but there is this little thing that, you know, only women can do in those nine months that they are pregnant uh, and, and carry a, um, a baby. Uh, and um, we have to have a fair amount of environment because even after giving birth, uh, there has to be um, um, a working uh, relationship uh, where they can um, 
combine family and work uh, and have all the tools uh, with home office, with flexible hours, that again, I try to provide in my team so that they can combine and not only network, but um, are really good in, in their work. Um, so that concludes my topic or my talk. And again, I think we have some time for discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Marius, for this uh, uh, outstanding lecture. And uh, that we're going to have uh, the discussion at the end of all presentation. And uh, my uh, the next speaker needs no introduction. Uh, Dr. Valeria Caso from the University of Perugia is the uh, ex-president of ESO. She is the individual who spearheaded uh, many ESO initiatives, including uh, seats, uh, including ESO East, uh, Angels uh, Rescue, and so many other uh, uh, international projects. I think uh, she's the person who has worked so hard for ESO than anybody else. And we're very looking forward to hear her lecture. And uh, another, I think, big advantage of Valeria is that she's always thinking out of the box and always providing alternative uh, solutions. So I think that the topic of her lecture about the way of uh, networking and if uh, women should be networking uh, differently than men, I think it's very, very appropriate. Valeria, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Georges. I think that I had my slide before, but I saw them. Can you put them yes, again? I saw them also. Yes, I saw your slides. Okay. So they were, yes. Uh, so in the meantime that you put the slide again, maybe uh, just to, to conclude uh, what, what we say when we talk about um, female and male network, you know, there's a lot of unconscious bias. And this is something that we really need to always keep in mind. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind, what, um, what we heard also before, that we tend to uh, exclude ourselves many times. And I think this is something that we should avoid because it's... it's um, um, probably we are already there but you know when when there are when when a, a woman apply for a job she needs to be 100% sure that um, that uh, she will she is has all the qualities to get this job and something that we absolutely need to to overcome uh, can you give my slides please Okay. Uh, Michelle, open audience. Can you please uh, can you please upload the uh, Valeria slides? Oh, hi there. Apologies, we haven't been given any slides of Valeria. So Valeria, would you mind sharing your own screen there, please? Okay, I will Thank do. Thank you so much. Sorry, this was my fault. So you see, it's always better not to, uh, maybe it's better to, to register. <laughs> okay. Do you see them? Uh, not yet. No. Okay. Just you share the screen, Valeria. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, normally for a woman, this would be the worst moment in her life because if this happened to a man and, it, and nobody would comment on this, which is, this, this can happen. But when it happens to women in such an international, let's say, uh, context, then it is disaster because they, everybody will say, uh, this is a typical female behavior because she's not able to, to, uh, do, to manage the, um, uh, the technology. So just to remind, there's a wonderful speak, uh, speech of Patty, Patty Smith when she was asked um, to, um, to be present 
uh, when the um, uh, Nobel Prize was given to, to Bob Dylan and she started and she wanted to sing and she was not able to sing. And uh, she was like, oh, it's, it's a disaster. She was thinking, oh, it's disaster. No, now I, I, I lost all my credibility. And then she realized that the day after people came to her um, saying, um, uh, thank you so much. If this happens to you, it can happen to, ev uh, to everybody. So you have to make uh, what is your normally your weakness, uh, your strengthness. It's something that I want to share regarding networking. I hope you see now my slides. Yes, yes, we do. Wonderful. And, uh... Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> because I have no ideas anymore. So okay. these are I, um, disclosure. So uh, I want to, uh, they, you, they don't uh, change. Valeria, can you change the slides? Well, because we see that just the, the introduction of your slide, your first slide, you change. Okay. So I think you need to. If you start okay. the slideshow, if slide you start the slideshow, that will that will make it full screen, Valeria. No, can you help me? Starting is just underneath the download button. So if you see where it says download, underneath it says start slideshow. If you press that, it will take it into full screen. It's next to print to PDF. Print to PDF, then start slideshow. Okay, now you see it. Not yet. Now? No. Do you have two screens there? Yes. Yeah, here it is. Perfect. Okay. Now it's going on. Yes. Yes. Oh, good, wonderful. Good. Thank you. These are my disclosures. So, uh, regarding uh, when we talk about first point of uh, networking is conversation is, is communication, and you see this is something that uh, Georges probably know why um, uh, who could could have sent this to me. This is from Peter Schellinger, uh, uh, pulling my leg always about female and male communication because you see uh, there, there there's a question from a man. Shall we go to have some 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 wine tonight and you see it's one and two and then the same situation is between men and uh, between two women talking about what to dress how to bring and who should not come and so on so it, there's already a different kind of communication and we have to learn also to um, to understand what we what we want when we want to uh, create network because we also have um, as women we try and we want and I uh, we are consider that we are tend to be less aggressive we tend to have want to have harmony we want to be we are more agreeable so what we want is is not a conflict we tend the way we want to create an alliance between uh, between our partners our network so in in uh, also we when you think about the female and the male network it's completely the starting point is completely different so we have different bo body language and we are not used to this, uh, what we said, this, um, this way how the old fashioned way of building networks, what we said, probably no, no one of you is playing golf because I know something is really changing because we always said uh, the real business are, do are done when you are playing golf with somebody or when you check and when you when you talk with other people in a in a let's say mixed environment where you have friendship and work together and you know it's clear it's not what you know we tend to be very for us it's very important to to build ourselves up create increasing our knowledge but not to think too much, oh, I know the best professor of the world, I have this fun, the, uh, this best mentor. We, first of all, we are a little bit more selfish because we are, it's a kind of insecurity in the beginning because we need to build us, build us up before really um, feeling uh, ready to face the rest of the world. And um, we don't like even the way that uh, how men network is done so this old boy network as we said uh, we they use men use uh, position to influence 
other and help other men. Um, but I think it's not true that we should uh, use this as the same networking. Don't think about ourselves sitting with our, let's say, little, little children and creating the, the job um, job network. Maybe this will be the future, but it will be always different because we we create also when we sit with other women discussing about work with our little children discussing. We all already create also some boundaries which are which are beyond the 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 only networking and in, in uh, work networking. So this is what we say men tend to look for, for to form alliances and men tend to um, this is what we learned from the business they're willing to do a business with anyone even it's not so important if they don't like if they like them as long as this person can help them to achieve their, their goal so it's 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 they're much more you tend to from a male point of view um people they tend to be much more pragmatic and what i said already Men are socialized from the get to understand the mixing business and friendship in what you do. And also they're quite, quite and even when uh, this work relationship is interrupted, it's not such, um, they don't leave this broken heart, let's say, if the same work relationship is interrupted uh, in, in a woman, because they, they, they split it, you know, it's a more pragmatic way to, to see the whole situation. Okay, this work is over, but it's not a friendship, this is over. We are a little bit more sentimental, let's say like this, in uh, maintaining our uh, working relationship. And what is our, I think, big, big, biggest mistake, and I, it was yesterday, I, I can tell you, yesterday I invited a patient, um, uh, he's a very, uh, we need some fundings for stroke, and we talked and he, he wanted to support me, and I didn't really wanted to ask him to support my, my association, my research, because I, thought, I felt that I, I, in my position I could exploit him, um, and I tend to be too many, maybe in the same situation, a male doctor with the same patient, he would, would have been probably much more successful in asking support in, in uh, continuing, um, in continuing the, 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 the research. And especially when women tend to seek for a mentor, they, they want to create, again, we want to have this kind of harmony um, rather than to have tough relations. And sometimes it's, it's also difficult. And I, I, I can tell you, I'm working almost with, almost with women, but from even for myself to be tough with another woman is for me much difficult much more difficult than to be tough to a young man. For example, to say, so um, this is, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't agree with you. It's for me easy because probably I have two male sons. So I'm used to, to tell them um, I'm doing a great and I, I will explain, but I'm always a little bit much, I'm much more, let's say, um, uh, agreeable with other women, uh, which I think sometimes is not always the best way to, to act. And they tend, and we also, and I think this is when when you say it's it's a mistake. I'm not sure, but we tend to overemphasize the moral aspect uh, aspect of of networking. And this is a very nice sentence from Helen Fisher. She's a PhD in neuro, neuropsychology. Um, they men's network also tend to be larger and broader, with an advantage because a wider audience will provide more opportunity. And, uh, and to and to get to be introduced to someone that may assist you with um, with career advancement, and um, they are, as I said already, they are more comfortable asking what they want. So again, remind my situation yesterday. Yesterday, sitting in front of a very uh, rich man who wanted to support me but not being so um, straightforward because I didn't, the, the fact that he was my patient before was in a way, I overemphasized this moral aspect. So I didn't, I didn't really came straight to the point. It's very important when you, when you want to create this network and you need support, you need money, you need uh, somebody who, who will help you to do this, then you have to be uh, really straightforward. It's, it's, it's for me personally, and I, when 
when I all, you know, we have a wonderful women network and I, I tend to confront myself with others, they repeat me that they tend to have the same, same reaction. So uh, this is a nice uh, paper uh, that we already heard about this. You see um, both men and women, for them it's important the, the network of centrality of the network. Uh, it's important, uh, the, the aspect of gender homophily, we heard this already, and uh, especially you, lie, you feel well when you have a person, you are surrounded by person, uh, by, um, for example, for women being in a context, even have the possibility, for example, to, uh, to exchange some uh, female problems like uh, I'm having my period or I'm I'm in my in difficult days I'm having headache it's something that it's important for you to share because this makes you feel much more um, uh, protected in the way that when when you are networking and this gives you also the the possibility then to expand and be ready to face the rest of the world. Because you know, there's a kind of, um, uh, when a woman promotes herself too much, she will not only criticized by men, but also by, by women. And, and you know, we, we are a little bit, again, this kind of moral over imposition is not helping us. So what we shall do is to, uh, as you already heard about social network, find a woman you like, promote her, show everybody around what she is doing. She will probably not doing it, but you as a, as a female peer can help her to promote herself in, in, in a, a be, being more visible. So you see a, 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 this uh, article, um, let's say, uh, concluded that a women uh, who have a dominate, female dominated inner circle have an expected jo uh, job placement level that is 2.5 uh, 2 times greater than women with low centrality and male dominated inner circle. So it's not true when you see, uh, but often probably it's good that uh, you already, many of these women who are listening are already a next generation. But when I started, I was one of the, only women in a in a male environment and believe me you are lucky and you heard this also from from our colleague to be in a mixed environment to have already some women around you helps you you cre you can create this inner circle in order to um, to promote yourself and to be more successful um, uh, to be more successful in uh, in in uh, reaching your career goal so I want to conclude because I don't want to um, to take too much time as I lost a little bit uh, at the beginning. So I think um, for women to advance professionally, we need to exploit our one, two advantage, a strong female support group. And we did this with wives and Else, Silke, Marie-Louise, uh, we, we start Francesca, we started it. We were lucky because we also had a condition in, the, in our society, which believed uh, we, let's say, we created an alliance. And uh, don't exclude men from our female network because it's very important that we have what, what we heard already, this mixed environment Environment, which is, I think, still the best environment where we can work in. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Valeria. As always, a uh, great talk on uh, this, this topic. Uh, our, our next speaker is someone from outside of our uh, community. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Anne-Marie schumacher Diemek. She is the past president of the Women's Brain Project and one of its founding members. She has a master in health psychology from the University in Surrey, and she has a PhD from the University of Bern. Currently, she is leading the palliative care program in Lucerne. Uh, Anne-Marie, I think uh, uh, your talk on the Women's Brain Project uh, will be hopefully inspiring to all of us. Uh, I am extremely impressed with how you have managed to 
take a topic, you have created a fantastic network and uh, what you have done in the past four years uh, with the Women's Brain Project is extremely impressive. So I look forward to hearing your talk. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your invitation to introduce Women's Brain Project. I'm Anne-Marie Schumacher. I'm one of the co-founders of Women's Brain Project and currently the president of this nonprofit organization. I've been invited today to talk about Women's Brain Project as an, an example of networking, of women networking together and working together. So how did this all start? It started off um, as an informal lunch between friends uh, where we talked about observations at our place of work. And the four of us, the four co-founders, that's Antonella Santicione Ciada, who is a medical doctor, Maria Teresa Ferretti, a neuroscientist, my, myself, a health psychologist, and Gautam Maitra, who worked in the pharmaceutical industry. We all had similar observations. And these were that um, there were various sex and gender differences in our studies, in our work, both in practice as well as in research. And we often realized that these differences were not being taken into consideration. And we thought, how about we do something about this? And that is how Women's Brain Project started off, with just the four of us. That was in summer 2016. Since then, the team has grown exponentially. And although we are registered in Switzerland, we, worked, we work on an international basis. So we have um, team members coming from different parts of the world and also from different disciplines ranging from medicine, psychology, communications, engineering, IT, um, you name it. So we have uh, experts from every field or nearly every field you can think of. So what is our women, mission as Women's Brain Project? What do we aim to do? Um, we started off with um, trying to create more awareness and motivating our um, colleagues in, in the scientific community to include sex and gender characteristics in their work, in their research work, in their medical practice. And since then, we have moved on to having a more active mission, so to speak, and that is to improve this ourselves through our own research and our own work. Um, in as a way to create a more precision medicine approach in all aspects of healthcare, starting from basic basic research, clinical trials, prevention campaigns, medical practice, diagnostic um, processes, as well as therapy. This is an example of what we do in the area of clinical trials. We, we encourage and work with pharmaceutical companies to consider sex and gender differences at every stage of clinical trials. In this way, it's a win-win situation. So we increase drug efficacy as well as drug safety profiles. But we also believe that in this way, all needs are met. So different, the needs of the different groups are met. So how did we organize ourselves to, to work uh, in this field? So um, we, we created four work streams in Women's Brain Project. And these are these four that you can see here on screen. The first one is preclinical science. The second is drug developing, the development and clinical science. We have another work stream um, focused on novel technologies and artificial intelligence in healthcare. And the last one um, is focused on social determinants, determinants of health and policy science. And in this way, what we try to do or what we, um, what we do is uh, the different people, the different expertise um, is allocated to the relevant work stream. And how is this reflected in our work? 
Well, we are active in many areas, and I think here I, it's important to mention that, that the vast majority of the team works pro bono. That means we all have our own um, paid employment, and Women's Brain Project is something we do on a voluntary basis. And we contribute in different activities. One activity which has been mostly the main activity is to publish and disseminate studies. I will talk more about how, how we do this and how networking is very important in this aspect of our work. We advocate um, at different levels with policymakers, with the scientific community and with other groups um, for the consideration of sex and gender differences in healthcare. We promote um, various various uh, issues in health for example our be brain powerful campaign where we promoted um, a healthy brain lifestyle through this campaign and collaboration we collaborate with various institutions and individuals um, this does not include only the expert but also patients and caregivers and in this way um, we are more effective in our work so what is our work? What are our objectives and long-term aims? Um, we strive to create evidence uh, about sex and gender differences in the various aspects of healthcare. And this is very important to Women's Brain Project to base our work on latest scientific research and the latest evidence. Secondly, is to include and involve the experts in the fields uh, that we work work in or work with. Um, and here again, networking is essential for this for this aim. And we continue to work to create awareness about this topic, to talk in in various fora like this one, for example, um, to encourage our colleagues, our sci scientists and other other stakeholders, to bear sex and gender differences in mind when um, doing their research or conducting their work. Last but not least is our long-term goal of creating a Precision Medicine Institute for brain and mental diseases. As I mentioned, most of us or nearly all of us work on a voluntary basis for Women's Brain Project, but this is not sustainable in the long term. We did achieve a lot considering that we were doing this apart from our daily daily jobs but imagine how much more we could achieve if we had to focus our energy on on this work so this is our our dream our long-term goal which we aspire and strive towards so just i would like to talk a little bit more about our work and what we do at Women's Brain Project. So as I mentioned, our group or our team has grown exponentially in these last um, five years. So we had to restructure. It was impossible. We were starting to have um, team meetings with 40, 40 people, which was proving to be impossible. So what we did is we, um, organized ourselves into working groups according to our interests and expertise and these are the working groups that are currently ongoing in women's brain project so we have education where we have a group of people working on um, our webinars or our workshops that we offer both for the scientific community as well as for the general public um, our science group which is I think the largest working group where we have different sub teams working on various publications and research projects, legal partnerships. As I mentioned, we work with various organizations. Um, so we have various agreements in place, fundraising and strategy. So again, Women's Brain Project is a nonprofit organization. The majority work pro bono, but still we have to cover expenses, the expenses of our work. And here we rely heavily on our sponsors and other donors. Policy, so policy is also an important part since we uh, 
also interact with policy policymakers that is part of our work ai and technology is another group and then communication because the dissemination and communication of our work of scientific work as well as our colleagues work is not only important for amongst our peers but also with the general public so we do our best to interact with the general public through social media and other media this is um an example or or a an overview of of what we do again so we publish both peer-reviewed publications as well as publications in the media for the general public um, we organize our own events and take part in other events teaching and outreach so again we give lectures talks workshops both for the general public as well as for in the within the scientific community for example we participate in congresses and other events and we also offer workshops or other events for corporate for organizations and we also uh, we are also active in prevention campaigns so we have quite a, a wide spectrum of activities that we that we are involved in So more examples, this is related to Alzheimer's disease. We have various um, publications that we um, published both, both as a Women's Brain Project team as well as Women's Brain Project together with um, other collaborators from other institutions. Um, another example is is this publication that we um, published uh, with regard to sex and gender differences and cardiovascular diseases. Uh, so here, uh, again, we worked with um, Elsa Sunset in, in this case, who is also a very good collaborator of Women's Brain Project. And again, we, we try to disseminate as much information as possible uh, about, about our topic, in this case, related to cardiovascular diseases. This is an example of one, one of our many webinars. Uh, before COVID, we, we used to do more on live events like workshops, and now um, we are very um, active with webinars. We also did one of the first webinars about sex and gender differences in the pandemic, right at the start of, of the pandemic in March, April 2020. Um, and this is another example of a webinar that we um, organized in collaboration with World Bank. So since the start of Women's Brain Project, um, there have been various publications and recognitions. Our CEO, our pro bono CEO, Antonella Santuchone Chada, won Woman of the Year in 2019. She also won the World Sustainability Award in 2020. So um, our work is being recognized, which is very, very encouraging. And also it, it shows us that we're on the right track. And that gives us the motivation to, to continue our work and to grow further. I would also like to mention um, more, talk more about our networking. So as I said, our work or reaching our goals is not possible without collaboration. And just to give you an idea, we have various collaborations going on. Um, on an international basis with global institutions or organizations such as Alzheimer's Disease International, as well as with organizations that are located in specific countries, um, such as Alzheimer's Research UK or um, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard in USA. So we have various collaborations going on and this enables us to be involved in various projects and to reach our goals. This is a mention of some of our sponsors and partners. Um, we work a lot with pharmaceutical companies, 
uh, but also with universities and other um, higher education institutions and research institutions, um, also um, hospitals and other organizations that support our work or work together with us on specific projects. I would like to finish by mentioning our main event. Um, we have already organized three editions of the International Forum on Women's Brain and Mental Health. The first one was in December 2017, so a year after we started, and that was held in Lausanne at the EPFL. The second one was at the University of Zurich, and the third one was planned to be held at the ETH in Zurich, but unfortunately due to COVID, we, have, we had to switch to online, to an online event. However, that also gave us the opportunity to reach more people with this, with this forum who would have otherwise not been able to attend our, our live event. Um, so again, this is, these are just some pictures from our events. Um, we also had Sofia, um Sophia the robot at our at our um 2018 forum um where we talked about the the development of AI of AI the role of AI in healthcare and our 2020 event was virtual and there are many um videos of our panel discussions available on our YouTube channel which you are free to visit I invite you to visit and to close, um, I would like to show you this video. It's a three minute video which summarizes our whole forum of 2020. And it also gives you a taste of the different um, topics related to sex and gender uh, differences in health and medicine um, that we work with. So I invite you to watch this video. I would like to welcome you all to the third International Forum on Women's Brains and Mental Health. The aspect related to how sex and gender have an impact on uh, brain and mental health. It is my great pleasure to be here with you today. Research has also shown that men's and women's brains function differently and unfortunately become diseased in a different way. It has been proven that vulnerability to brain and mental diseases is affected by both sex and gender. Right now, as we look at the current environment, COVID-19 is impacting all aspects of people's life. Generation after generation have not talked about suicide. We have to change that. Even today, with screening in place, the majority of women who are suffering from a postpartum depression do not get identified and do not get treatment. What we do not have today uh, is uh, uh, data. And this is something that uh, we have to work a lot about it uh, because uh, we have to give answers. By understanding sex and gender differences, we will understand the normal functioning of the brain. Secondly, it will project us one step closer to personalized medicine, the medicine of the future. I think that uh, we are just at the beginning, the beginning of this uh, new era in which uh, we are focalizing on these uh, gender diversity and sex issues. I believe with all my heart that my children will never die in early onset disease. What are the consequences of the pandemic aside from the infection itself? One of the things that is developing now is pandemic fatigue. Our brains are wired to connect and to belong. The first thing that we need to see in the, the eyes of the, one, the person that we have in front is that they understand and they respect us. Reconnection between evidence-based or science or knowledge that actually we hold and how this can be transformed and applied 
into very concrete policies. And, and there we still have a long way to go. There are modifiable risk factors for cognitive decline and dementia. So we know that there are modifiable risk factors. There is something we can do for our risks. Women's brain health remains one of the most underdiagnosed, under-researched and under-treated fields in medicine. Digital solutions should be based on unmet needs of people living with the disease and should give back more to the user than it actually takes. The patient has to be involved from the grassroots of development. I'm here to help launch the Be Brain Powerful campaign. It's reaching tens of thousands of women. Action is incredibly important. And so what we're going to do now is to think about a challenge. We're going to call it a hackathon to do that. It's going to be, in a sense, a learn by doing experience. I finally ask you to clap your hands. Thank you for joining me to watch this video. I hope this my presentation together with the summary of last year's forum gave you an idea, a good idea of our work and Women's Brain Projects Network in a nutshell. And I invite you for more information, I invite you to follow us on social media and to visit our website where you can read more about our work and about us. And if you are interested in joining our network, I encourage you to contact us. We would be happy to have you have your contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anne-Marie, for a great overview of the Women's Brain Project. Our next speaker is another person who's well known in our community, uh, Dr. Gianmarco De Marquis. He is the head of acute, acute neurology and the dep deputy head of the stroke unit at the University Hospital in Basel. He is the principal investigator of a prospective cohort study uh, on atherogenic lipoproteins in ischemic stroke, the ageless uh, study. He is involved in many activities in our organization, both in uh, the social media PR committee and also uh, has done a tremendous amount of work on our guidelines. So, John Marco, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Gianmarco De Marquis. I work at the University Hospital in Basel, Switzerland, and it is my pleasure to speak about networking as a tool for leadership. Thank you to the organizers for the kind invitation of speaking here. In this beautiful old town in Nice, I met 2008 during the European Academy Conference of Neurology, this young colleague, Mira Katan. In 2008, she was a young, motivated resident, and now she's a young, motivated attending and is a chair of the scientific committee. Mira gave a brilliant presentation on copeptin as a biomarker for prognosis after a stroke. After the oral presentation, I approached Mira and I told her, Mira, congratulations for your presentation. I think we should validate your findings in a new independent cohort. Mira was immediately very supportive and enthusiastic. And in Bern, Switzerland, where I was working back then, so 80 kilometers away, we duplicated and validated the um, co-risk uh, trial, confirming that copeptin added uh, prognostic information after ischemic stroke. And we managed uh, to publish that into neurology. And so this was an example of uh, how a young uh, network uh, can work and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring can be a way. Miha uh, is slightly more experienced than I am, and we both believe that peer-to-peer -peer mentoring uh, can work. Uh, Mira taught me that quality matters, 
we both learn to listen to the facts and not only to our young age. It is important to have a healthy dose of mutual uh, trust, to always assume the best uh, of the other persons, uh, and to be open also to constructive criticism, both inside and uh, towards us. And joint trial of error is no, much more fun. So in a young network, you can laugh, you can uh, make mistakes, uh, you can be naive. Uh, main thing is that you learn from these uh, uh, mistakes. Young mentors and also more uh, senior networks uh, tend to self-expand. Uh, and uh, Mia introduced me to Else Sunset, uh, whom you all know as the ISO uh, General Secretary. I mentioned that back then I was working in Bern in Switzerland and I was a young resident and I had a young attending. The young attending's name was uh, Urs uh, Fischer, who is now chair of neurology at uh, the University Hospital in Basel in Switzerland. So uh, what Urs taught me is that uh, mentors uh, as him can teach you neurology and science but also soft and crucial skills. You have and can benefit from the whole package because soft skills like uh, communication, self-organization and leadership are important. And moreover, when you have younger but talented mentors such as me and Ulse, you share the similar, similar generational values because uh, more or less, you were born in the same historical context, and you can uh, maybe, as a team, better understand younger generations like the Generation Y. And coming from different geographic and cultural uh, regions is enriching. You know, in Switzerland, we don't only speak German. I come from the Italian-speaking region of Switzerland, from the southern part, whereas uh, Ulsa and Mia come from the German-speaking part. So it is important to get outside uh, of your comfort zone and to approach each other and uh, find a common gr ground where you can all learn from uh, the others. I mentioned Else and uh, Ursa are or were the ESO General Secretary and the ESO Conference uh, are key for expanding uh, networking. Here in Barcelona, Sp Spain, uh, in 2016, I had the privilege of uh, uh, meeting for the first time uh, uh, Professor Avin Berge, who unfortunately passed away last year. Avin uh, was the first and principal investigator of the TWIST trial comparing tenecteplase to best medical treatment in acute ischemic wake-up stroke. As I uh, learned from him and from this uh, beautiful manuscript uh, on him, uh, where Elsa contributed, uh, Avin had a broad training in medicine and cardiology, but he managed to become a respected stroke expert, clinical trialist, and scientist. So it's important to think outside of the box. As a neurologist, we have to know about the heart, and cardiologists have to know about the brain. Networking is also key for investigator-driven trials because networking stimulates recruitment. International networking opens your mind uh, to new cultures and ways of communications. And here the example, the concrete results of this uh, networking led by Avin Bash, Elisif Matiesis, uh, and uh, uh, Melinda Holzen. You can see that patients in TWIST uh, were included from all over the world, from the UK to New Zealand. And the recruitment was successful despite the pandemic. The recruitment concluded the uh, end of September 21. Avin then invited me to join the uh, guideline working group on intravenous uh, thrombolysis, where I had the privilege to meet all these uh, um, stroke uh, experts and 
within the ESO guideline board where I serve, I also had the privilege to meet and work regularly with uh, Simona Sacco and Guillaume Turc, who are the chairs of the ESO guideline board. But going from Norway to Greece, I admit that a car is not the ideal tool to go, but I would like to show you this Grand Tourer electric uh, prototype, GT. Why GT to Greece? Of course, because of Georgios Tsivkulis in top gear. Georgios um, got this uh, beautiful and uh, cornering uh, profile in Lancet uh, in Neurologies, uh, uh, which I really encourage you to read. And Georgios embodies and taught me the values of ethos, logos, pathos here in the, in also in the Greek alphabet, acknowledging that in Europe, we also have different alphabets. And ethos stands for the right methods and right authority. Logos stands for solid facts, stories that matter. And pathos stands for impassionated plea or a convincing uh, story. This credo uh, was founded by Aristoteles uh, here on the right, and Georgios uh, uh, talked me to also add speed to that. Speed is also important in clinical work. And uh, Georgios and Marius were friends. Georgios uh, uh, always uh, told me positive uh, things about Marius, and Marius uh, uh, then ended up coming at our institution here uh, in Basel, where he's the head of neuroradiologists. And together, uh, talking about speed, we had uh, the opportunity of treating this young patient with an M1 occlusion. And uh, where we achieved a door to reperfusion time within 55 minutes. Marius uh, rightly uh, always underscores speed and streamlining of all processes. Uh, and we are so lucky of working together because as a team, we are able to reach uh, this. Also skipping, for example, the um, emergency room for patients uh, who are stable and can go straight to the angio uh, cat lab. So this is really uh, something which is a pleasure to work with. And uh, uh, talking about uh, um, trials, it is also important to um, mention industry-led trials. You see here uh, Valeria Caso, past ESO presidents, Mike Sharman and Robert Hart, who gave a brilliant presentation a couple of years ago on the campus trials uh, comparing aspirin to rivaroxaban and aspirin. Campus was a positive trial, but uh, the winning uh, combination of aspirin uh, combined with rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams uh, was started only one month after an ischemic stroke. And they told me, actually, we should do the campus trial in the immediate uh, post-acute stroke phase on day zero of an ischemic stroke. Well, the sponsor, Bayer, was... Uh, um, for different reasons, uh, um, not supportive of this idea, but they were supportive uh, of an at least equally stimulating idea uh, concerning an oral factor 11 inhibitor, uh, Asundexian, which is now being tested in a phase two clinical trials among patients with an ischemic non cardiobolic uh, stroke. So both investigator-driven trials and industry-funded trials are pivotal to improve patient care. And uh, Valeria, Mike, Bob, and uh, I are part of the steering committee of the Pacific uh, uh, Stroke Phase Two trials, whose results are being uh, presented, by the way, at the ESOC 22 in Lyon. So it's really important to, to also be open to this kind of collaborations, but also to members of your networks uh, like Diana and Maria Luisa, with whom you don't have yet a concrete project, but uh, with whom you could have in the future concrete research projects uh, to work on. And coming to the end, I would like to acknowledge part of the members of, uh, of uh, the network the list is not uh, uh, complete, but you can see in the middle 
Basel. Why Basel? As I told you, Basel has a sort of a magnetic attraction power. I was in Bern since eight years. I'm now working in Basel. But meanwhile, also Miha Katan uh, came to Basel, Urs Fischer came to Basel, Marius Pehogius, and of course they did not come because I was there, but uh, because of different uh, uh, trajectories. Uh, but we are so happy to work all together here in Basel. And for two days, even Georgius was in Basel independent of a conference. And this is uh, the pictures of uh, the night we spent uh, uh, together with Mira, Ursa, uh, Marius, Georgius, and me. And you can see you have a free seat around the table. And this seat is for you, for the new network uh, members. So in summary, network, expand your horizons. You can learn from everybody and every situation, even from people whom you don't like. From them, you can learn the don'ts. Network members often come from different linguistic regions. That's the beauty. And if you have a misunderstanding, clarify immediately. Avoid unconscious bias. Always focus on the content. And last but not least, have fun. So please feel free to stay in touch with me through Twitter. And uh, I really look forward to the conversation right now. Thank you for your attention. Thank, Thank you. you. I think yeah. you have convinced us that uh, Basel is the stroke capital of uh, Europe. And uh, sorry, Elsa, for interrupting. Uh, the floor is yours. I apologize. No, 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 no worries, uh, Georgios. Uh, interrupting is my specialty, so I'm glad someone interrupts me at times. Uh, thank you, Gianmarco. That was a, a fantastic talk. I think you touched upon some very good points, especially peer mentoring and establishing relationships, focusing on the science and having fun while you do it. And I think this is, uh, this is, uh, I would say, uh, what I learned as well from uh, being Ivan's men mentee over many years. Uh, he, this was his uh, focus. His uh, advice was always to uh, you learn one or two things at a conference, but always meet three new people. <laughs> So uh, I think we can. Uh, uh, I think we have all the speakers now. Should be come on, come on screen. So I would kindly, Anne Marie, if you can turn on your camera, uh, and and Francesca Marius. as well, and Marius, and we have have all, 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 all the speakers. And we we would like to open as well for for questions. Uh, please use the raise hand function. We have gotten quite a lot of comments in the chat uh, uh, as as well, more general comments. But uh, please do use the raise hand option if you have a question for some of the speakers or or uh, and, and any comments. While we are waiting, Georgius, I think this is your first voice workshop. Right. So, what what is your what is your take home for for uh, for, for from the meeting uh, we've had today? I think that uh, collaboration is uh, the only way forward, and uh, I strongly believe that um, uh, opportunities should be offered uh, to the north and south in Europe, to men and women, to young and uh, less young. Uh, and I think that uh, diversity is uh, very dynamic and should be implemented in uh, different ways and different perspectives. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, I became faculty in Greece, which is a very, uh, very hierarchic country. And uh, there are very few positions to uh, be able to get in a university. We have only seven universities, thanks to a woman. I was very fortunate that uh, uh, the only uh, female chairman, a chairperson in uh, the university in Greece, in Alexandropolis, believed in me when I was rejected both by the big professors in Athens and Thessaloniki. So now I have, uh, you know, become what they call a big professor in, uh, in Athens, and uh, which is like representing 50% of the population in Greece. And uh, what I need to do is increase the ratio of uh, a female faculty in Greece in neurology, uh, and especially promote them to, lead, to, to reach the chairmanship level. I'm very fortunate now that at least 
we have two chair women in uh, in Greek neurology. So I think this is I this is something that I owe to the to this uh, female professor who gave me the opportunity to become a faculty in my country when I came back from US. And sorry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank uh, you very much, uh, Georgios. I think uh, I think uh, that that is. Um, I I know that you are working quite hard on on uh, this, and that you also uh, your main focus is 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 the science, and you don't uh, you close your eyes a bit about to to if they are men or women. It's it's all about the science for you. So um, uh, yes, but in Greece, the, which is, yes, a southern European country, women don't have the same chance as men, and this needs to change. I think. Yes, I think I think uh, I I always usually disclose that I come from 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 Norway. I, I've grown up with two two working parents, and uh, it's uh, th things are a bit different in in the north. We still have a bit of a way to go. Silke, I think you have a have a, a comment. Yes, I've got a question actually for Anne Marie. That was a really very fantastic project you've introduced to us. And my question is, how did you get it started? Because you mentioned that you all worked. In the beginning, you all worked on an honorary basis. How did you get all these science projects started? And it seems that, or at least it looks as if this video you showed us that needs a lot of, well, special expertise to get this um, produced and cut in that, such an excellent way. Can yes. you share with us well, this? Uh, I'll start from your first question. Well, how we started, I mean, and we still are working, uh, most of us, pro bono. And as I said, um, we, we rely on, on sponsors because we don't get um, paid for our time, but we try to cover our expenses. So um, we actually do not cover all our expenses. So if I have a meeting in Zurich and I catch the train, I don't claim those expenses. I pay them out of pocket. But if I fly to a Congress in the US, which I haven't done for a while now, unfortunately, then we kind of look for sponsors so that we don't pay that out of our personal budget. Um, you mentioned also the, the forum um, that was done, the video uh, was done professionally. Um, we, we have a, there is, we worked with a conference um, organize, event organizers who was, were also quite good with with um, doing things online and that cost a lot of money and we would not have been able to do that without sponsors um, we couldn't pay that you know it's thousands and thousands for just videos um, but it was important especially since the congress was only online so it, it would have been a pity all our work all the hours that we put in and all the speakers who are not paid you know for the for the forum um you, you have to invest in that otherwise it's it's not worth the the effort um and how we we got in touch it's through personal contact and i must admit that we were quite overwhelmed after the first year because we didn't expect such a response and in the beginning we struggled because once we started getting you know out there and using social media we were getting so many um uh requests to take part in events and uh that was one reason why we needed more people on the team because we couldn't just just the four of us always say yes i mean we are tied with our work during the day we can't always you know take time off and and also uh, with volunteers we just talked about this in our last meeting so all, we all have a team meeting once a month on a tuesday night so our asian and american team members can also take part and we get so many people saying i want to work as a volunteer it's great but you also need to have someone who organizes that and coordinates and that's quite a challenge you know so um what we do with the sponsoring money is that we have two people working in administration and we pay them on an hourly basis it's not much unfortunately and we have someone who helps us in communication as well yeah Thank just you. just a comment there on Anne Marie because I've been following you a bit from the side and a bit on the inside uh, yes. since, 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 since the beginning and I think what what is quite special with you you've you've been extremely good at being proactive 
you've taken con you've contacted and you have not been afraid of getting a no uh, when it comes to contacting big journals regarding projects and and you've been extremely proactive and quite uh, i would say perhaps um a bit uh unlike uh, your regular normal women uh, who would be a bit more reserved because you have been you believe so much in in the cause and you have been very proactive and i think that is part uh, part of your success and what has really really impressed me in how you have built both your brand and your cause and i think this is this is something you should not un underestimate the how, how you antonella and maria teresa have been you've been so proactive and uh, it, it's it's been amazing to see the growth you've had uh, and what you have achieved in the, these uh, these years thank you and i must say it, it's much easier when you are asking for help financial support or other kinds of support for a cause i would feel very embarrassed to do it for myself but since it's you know i think that helps as well and we also have different people who are good at different things um i am not the best person who goes asking around for money but uh we have other you know other people in the team who who are also experts in fundraising and and really help us you know with the right pitch because this is also something with networking and dissemination we realized very early on when we were getting people from other disciplines on board that scientists are not the best people to communicate on social media or in, in the mass media because we are very, we want to include all the details, you know, and and it's not always the best way to communicate the message, you know, the, the general public maybe would not appreciate if what significance th these results have, you know, statistically, <laughs> you would need other wording and we also got help there with communication experts. Uh, to help us translate our our message. So, great. I think we have another comment, Christine. Yes, thank you very much. This was very inspiring, and um, I, I worked a lot of for increasing the visibility and and for for approaching. And I think what I learned was uh, actually that men are louder, and uh, and uh, and you have to you have to be more active to 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 create and to motivate a, 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 a network of women. Uh, so so you need one or two persons that are uh, that are completely motivated also to approach members that might not be want to be members. So this part um, this part needs some some. Uh, uh, needs to be observed, uh, especially for for the differences in, in in the networking between women and men, and um, and and it's not. And at the end, uh, in the leadership, if you are up there, uh, they might be raise their voices the, in the same way, 50-50, but but down on the basis of which is the, the the bottom up approach, which we try to have in the wise network. You have to be very active in approaching different types of member from different countries uh, so this is not this is not really solved by just being virtual uh, and I was thinking a lot how to do it in the best way not approaching every single member which I did for two years uh, but but maybe maybe reaching out in a, in, a, in, a, in a more virtual way but but actually this this is a very important point in increasing visibility to be proactive with many members in a, in a more personal way. And that's more women than men. Yeah, that's just the, just the point to add. And I, I think every, every presentation was, was inspiring by itself. Um, I, I think you should, you should make more obvious the, the, the aims and the mission of WISE in this, because we have to find ourselves and have our own mission in this and not just connecting. Georgios, you have a comment there. Thank you, Christine. I have a question for Marius. How many female speakers do you have in the Val d'Isère conference or in Esmint, where you're really presenting uh, uh, interesting cases, difficult uh, case scenarios, and a state of the art uh, endovascular therapies for stroke, not only for cerebral ischemia, but also aneurysms and AVM? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Georgios. And I think the, the answer is not a satisfactory one. So I think we have around 10 to maybe 15%. Uh, and out of my head, I, I 
I remember Marta from Zuckert and maybe um, Francesca from Bonn, but uh, those are the, the main uh, speakers there. And uh, if you see the executive committee of assessment, I think there is some work we have to do. I, I have a comment and I have a question, and this is, I think, uh, for all of you, but I will start with uh, Valeria and, and Tom. Uh, we are talking about networks and establishing networks and becoming a part of a network. And I think Jan Marco described it very well, how, how we actually, what is a network and how do you build a network? A network is uh, something that develops through collaboration over time. And also you collaborate with one person who introduces to you to the next person, introduces you to the next person, and suddenly you're a collaborative group. Uh, one of the challenges I think that a lot of women have, Valeria, is that they tend to say no mm -hmm. and sometimes are a bit too afraid to say yes because they think perhaps it, it, the imposter syndrome, I'm not good enough, I won't be able to do it. Uh, my point there is I think if you're asked, someone thinks you're good enough so you should do it but but how what can we as wise and a society do to overcome this aspect and this is i, I think about valeria first and then perhaps Tatan. i'll give you some time to think <laughs> uh, thank you, Elsa, for this uh, this question. You know, uh, we talked about this, that I was so surprised when I became president. I said, now I will have a lot of women around me because I will ask them. And um, I had the board on behind me. Everybody was said, oh, this, we need a new, wonderful society, gender, a more representation of females, and so on. And then I start to ask, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And I received a lot of no. So then I uh, then I start, you know, I'm uh, I called again and I try to motivate. I told them, even if you are not perfect, nobody of us is perfect. And then uh, there was some like funny situation when a man presented and I said to them, look at them. They are they are the most famous men and they're doing mistakes as well as we do. So there's always this 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 wish to be absolutely perfect and not to be criticized. It's something that uh, will not help us because we will be criticized and we will not create always harmony and I learned from Ken Lees and um, when I became president he said you uh, will, you have two uh, you have two um, uh, choices or to be loved as a president or do in what you believe and I said okay I, I think I would choose this second option I will uh, I will continue. I will continue my way in acting, but I also need to to understand that I have to follow my my way, and I will have criticism from many people. But this is a learning process, and I think that the women I I taught, I I brought with me, it was a long way to go. But um, you have to uh, reinforce the message again and again. And what we said, bottom up and top down, also top down because we were there to choose. We looked who were the best one, who were the most uh, cited in Medline, but also um, from, this was from the top, but also from the bottom because we had this vice group and we said, believe in you. I, I know that you number one, you will do it. And, and you, there are even be, because we are, we have still, even as women, this unconscious bias that it should be a man. And even when you talk about surgeon, why should be a man, should be a surgeon a man? It's not a question about being a man, a better surgeon than a woman, because we are used to see a male surgeon, but we have to think out of the box go further because we have the same skills, the same, we need the same opportunities and we need to support each other. That was really well said, Valeria. I really enjoyed everyone's talks and thank you for your question, Elsie. Um, just to follow up on Georgios's comments about the only individual who makes no mistake is the one who takes no action. It's, it's off, I think about the Wayne Gretzky quote, you know, you, you miss 100% of the goals you don't take. So you have to dare to ask. You have to go for that leadership position, that journal editorial position. You have to ask. If you don't ask, you won't get it. And you can't wait to be nominated because if you wait to be nominated, you may no one may know that you're interested. So for example, when the SVIN 
you know, like nominations for officers came up, Amir Hassan, the, the current president asked, Tan, what do you want to do when you're done with this secretary position? And I said, I want your seat. And I made it clear to him to, so he would know that so that he would help me get that seat. And once you announce it, then people will help you get it. And even if you don't get it, that's okay. I've, I've missed other seats that I've wanted, but in so doing, when people have interviewed me for that seat, they said, oh, maybe she can use another seat. And I got another seat that I was really, really happy about. So you gotta go for these um, leadership positions, the goals you want. And then the other question about imposter syndrome, why you say no, why you say no could be because you're overcommitted and you just don't have capacity. And that's totally reasonable. You have to say no. But if you are saying no, because you don't think you're good enough, I don't think that's good enough. I think you need to step up and go for it. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from uh, Susanna. Please turn on your camera and, and your microphone, Susanna. So uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, all the presentations. And uh, for me, very inspiring was the uh, lecture or presentation by Jan Marco, who spoke about the mentors. And I think that um, we want that uh, women have more success and build the networks, we should um, support them from the beginning. Uh, we should support the young doctors uh, who are working because in East European countries was the idea that uh, you can start if you have some age. So uh, young people were not very interesting. When I became the professor in the age of 50, the professor told me, so young and professor, and I felt that I am too old for it. So uh, we have the experience that we started to work with young uh, doctors who are men and women. We did not distinguish it. And we start collaboration with a lot of countries. And we, uh, we showed to these young women that there is the possibility how to go uh, further, how, how to build their career. And uh, today they are very uh, successful. And uh, at our department, I can tell we are, we are one of the best now at our faculty, but thanks to it that we uh, showed to young uh, doctors that they can do something, uh, but uh, they need to support, to support. And that is why this uh, last lecture was inspiring for me that uh, the good mentor can attract uh, the young doctors uh, to move in their uh, scientific life. Yes, thank you, Susanna, for the great uh, feedback. Uh, uh, at our university, there is a structural mentorship program where more senior faculty can mentor younger colleagues, and this is very welcome uh, within the university. And we really had the uh, option and the opportunity to detect young talents very soon after med or even during medical school and to cult cultivate them uh, up to residency and faculty. So it's very worthwhile to start soon because the peers are already there within our medical schools. And uh, knowing about imposter syndrome and other forms of unconscious bias uh, can be helpful uh, to, to avoid this kind of bias and to support more specifically uh, the person involved. And at the end of the day, it is a win-win situation. Of course, uh, if it is a healthy relationship, it's a win for the mentee, but also for the mentor. And, um, and by the way, we are used to, to see mentors, mentors are older people. And uh, as I mentioned, they can be even peers. So we, we really can learn from, from each other. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think this is the beauty of this uh, whole thing, but it really uh, encourage all institution to establish a, sort of a mentoring uh, uh, program in this sense. I, I agree with you there, uh, John Marco, and I, I and I think, but I, formal mentoring is important. But I think you touched upon a very important topic, and that is is peer mentoring because. Mm -hmm. you mentoring relationships are not I, I don't think they can ever be forced so sometimes you just have to look for mentors perhaps outside your institution or someone uh, someone who will uh, support you and promote you 
Uh, I also think there's one point, uh, and this is to Susanna as well. I, I, I really, your comment is so important. And I think we as women, we have to be very aware of not being afraid of the younger women who are better than us. We need to promote them and support them because once you start pushing down 10 years younger women who are up and coming, you have failed. Uh, in my opinion, you have already failed. Those are the people you need to bring them onto your team. You need to promote them in any way you can, and you really need to help them reach the next step. And we as women, we have to be aware of that as well, because I think sometimes our initial reaction is that, oh, you're, you're threatening my position, but uh, we should really overcome that feeling and think, how can I help you? I need you on my team. So that is, um, I think we have a comment from Virginia first, and then then from Valeria. Yes, hello, thank you very much. This was a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I am a stroke epidemiologist uh, from the US and I am uh, help with the prowess group, which is similar to the wise group, looking at um, the sex differences in, uh, in stroke, uh, primary, secondary, all aspects of stroke. And I wanted to share an experience that I had. I talk with reporters a lot. I get asked to, um, to comment on other people's research. And recently I spoke with a reporter from uh, Neurology Today. And anecdotally, she told me that, you know, she thanked me for agreeing to talk with her. And she told me that she has so many no's, negatives from women, neurologists, who she asked to, to comment on someone else's research. And she says either they don't answer her back or when they do answer her back, they, they say no and they refer her to another senior man in their department. And she said it's, it's very frustrating to her because she gets the information of who she contacts you know, based on her knowledge and her experience, she's been doing this for many, many years. And she offered to speak to our group and I'm sure other groups to help educate, um, uh, you know, women to say, how do you talk to reporters? They may be nervous about saying something um, incorrect or that it's not okay to say, I don't know. But it was just very interesting, um, you know, that, that she shared that with me. And uh, this goes to this conversation about, you know, what do you say yes to? What do you say no to? And how do you build build your confidence um, and and be mentored to help be able to to talk with reporters? And this goes to the dissemination and and sharing. And I just wanted to to contribute that. Thank you very much, uh, Virginia. I. I uh... I completely agree, and I think this is the experience of many. The, the 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 no, there are many reasons for that, but I think we need to probe probe those reasons a bit more. Uh, Valeria, yes, I wanted just to add something about mentoring. I think that we we are facing uh, now a new phase of mentoring. As we said, now we are going ahead with more peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, which is excellent. And you know, when you do your specialization, you had the one from the first year that helps you from the, the one with the, from the second year and third year and so on. So it's a, it's a way that we supported and uh, taught each other growing up. Now the mentoring positions are a little bit, uh, let's say they become more and more challenging because you know that many male professors are refusing to mentor women because of the Me Too situations, which is in a way uh, not um, it's something that we need to face um, because it's, it's a point that probably if they refuse, they're afraid of themselves, could be one reason, because they're used that they can treat women in, in, um, in an unrespective, uh, respectful way. But in, in the same way that we as women will be mentor. So we need also to, um, to um, in, improve our mentoring skills. So in the moment that a mentor has the imposter syndrome, which can happen we, because we tend to have it more, uh, we are less 
sure about our knowledge, then we have more difficulties to teach. So this is, you know, maybe at the beginning of the year, there was a kind of art, an article on nature about the low level of female mentoring. So again, we have to be prepared because we will be more and more women in leading position. But at the same time, we need to be skilled enough um, to improve our um, will, uh, way to, well, uh, to, to have relationship with our mentees because we are not taught to do this. And I think this is something that we need to face, especially when you, let's say you have a young, handsome, wonderful, uh, good looking, uh, <laughs> good looking uh, mentee as as a as a woman so sometimes you 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 need to to handle this kind of situation which is which seems so normal you think you are you are banal telling something like this but this is a situation that we have to learn to to manage and we have to do better than it was done in the past <laughs> absolutely valeria do we have any more comments or or questions And I think we're reaching uh, reaching the end. Uh, Georgios, any final comments from uh, from you? Yeah, I saw ahead from Marius. No, Ma Marius applause what you were saying, Valeria. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. It was uh, sorry. I, I want to raise my hand. Uh, I, okay. I to, with the icon, uh, I I just I want to applause and and also after Gianmarco talked about mentorship, I want to say that. Uh, also this field, so again, I'm, I'm supporting your claim, Valeria, but this is a field that has to be fair. So if, if we do mentorship, but uh, again, we mentor the children of our golf uh, buddies, then uh, it's not really an effective mentorship. So um, uh, again, I have the privilege to don't play golf, so I can uh, you know talk about this, <laughs> but uh, I think it, it has to be uh, also fair towards uh, females. Uh, or the other way around, if you're a male, uh, a female professor. Uh, but uh, as we, um, you know, move on as a community and, and we also evolve, I think, in the last decades, we have to take and, and be professional about this sexistic aspect of it, you know. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a really important uh, point, I think. Uh, and I, I, that's something I, we, we should maybe try and do, like also Georgios said, you know, female professors and also start from the beginning with female uh, uh, PhDs. So try to have a an, an, uh, fair environment for those also. Excellent. I completely agree, Marius. Francesca, a comment from you? Yes. I yes, think we're, we're a bit over time. For, so so yeah. for those who want to leave the discussion, you are feel free, feel, 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 Feel free to leave the meeting, but I think we will continue the discussion a bit more over time, uh, Francesca, yes. and I'm sure I look forward to hearing from you. Yep. Thank you very much. No, I just uh, wanted to uh, tell you what the words that today during this discussion at uh, struck me more. Fairness uh, from Mario, I, I, I really agree with that. And sometimes fairness, it doesn't really depends on what is your uh you know your gender but also your background where you're from what are the chances that you had in life to reach a certain uh a, a certain results so support fairness and there is another word that really uh, i liked very much is resilience resilience that we need uh to to carry on and to live with more happiness this complexity as we are living in a very complex network and in order to have the best of it and to uh, share the best of it with uh, with all those that contribute fairly to the network i think we need to be resilient and also to accept the others and their characteristics not to be afraid or scared by diversity so this is my uh, personal take a message from all the wonderful things that I heard today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Georgios. Yeah, I would like to add two other words. The first one is meritocracy and the second one is reciprocity. So networking is mean it means that uh, you're promoting the right kind of people, the best people, and also that this relationship is two way. There is reciprocity 
and uh, we have seen uh, more senior colleagues who who designed and um, managed big international registries and in the end of the day this was a one-way relationship and uh, there were many people who contributed to these res re registries and they were never acknowledged and i believe strongly in uh, mutual collaboration and uh, this should be always a two-way relationship Great. I think then we are coming to an end. Uh, I think those are very clever words to end from uh, Francesca and Georgios, and we will hear some final words from, from Silke. It's been a great pleasure. I want to thank you very much for taking the time uh, out of a December afternoon and evening, and uh, I'm wishing you a great uh, Christmas eventually and December. Over to you, Silke. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Elsie. I have the pleasure now to add some closing remarks and further announcements. I would like to start with a huge thank you to Esse and Gorgios for moderating this webinar and also for this really great discussion. Also, many thanks to Maria Luisa to organize this meeting and to choose the topic. I think that was quite important and we all have learned a lot. Our thanks also go to Megan from ESA and to the open audience organizers. That was important that you've given us the possibility to meet even if only virtually, I think that was really important to well, speak about this topic. And last but not least, of course, a YouTube thank you to our excellent speakers. That was fantastic. And also to the audience where, who actually helped us with this lively discussion. And we really, really hope that the world will be full of wise networks in the future. I hope you can all see my screen. Is that possible? We see it and it's in full screen. Great. And we have a new idea which we would like to share with you. That is one of the two announcements I would like to add. We thought it's quite difficult with all these virtual meetings and especially with starting collaborations for all those new members we've got, fortunately, and we are really happy to have these new members. So we've got the idea to start a networking lounge and we would like to suggest to do that in February, just um, well between now and the ESOC um, meeting in hopefully then in person in Lyon. And we will come back with some further information regarding this meeting very soon, just after Christmas. So if you've got any ideas or any wishes, just email Maria, Lisa, Luisa and me, and then we are happy to, to take that up and Hopefully we will proceed with this meeting. Another announcement is that we've got next week, um, Wednesday, we've got the WSO stroke in the very elderly seminar at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And speakers are our wise members, Jenica Kerr from Estonia and Ariana lofrencic Hussian from Croatia. That will be surely very, very interesting. And um, I'm really looking forward to joining this meeting too. And finally, we would like to ask you to all switch on your cameras because we would like to have a nice team photo of this meeting. We had one the last time we had this webinar and it's always quite nice to have this memory for the future. Thank you very much. And if I don't see you again, I wish you a good time and thank you for joining. I'm smiling, everyone. <laughs> Michelle, join, please. <laughs> and Megan. I'm sorry, I can't show me to, today. <laughs> Can you let us know when the photo is done? No, open audience. Yeah. Can someone let us know if the photos have been taken? <laughs> yes, I will do, and I'm just yeah. taking them now. So bear with me.
Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. So I will say on behalf of uh, Silke, Marilisa, Georgius and myself and all the speakers, thank you very much for joining in. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all in person. Uh, I don't know what the next letter in the Greek alphabet is, but uh, hopefully we won't have that version <laughs> in May. <laughs> Thank you bye very bye. much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye